The New Testament reading is from Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the, Lord, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of God for the people of God. The gospel reading is from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 8. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with deafled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And they are also many other condition, traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with deafled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about your hypocrites, as, in, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he, then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by g going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Sexual immortality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of our Lord. Thank you. So, uh, as we bring this... Um, sermon series uh, to a close that I'm calling Methodism 101. Uh, I wanted to end uh, with this idea of holy conferencing. So uh, United Methodists, uh, we really love to conference. We like to get together. And I'm not talking about things like phone conferencing or Zoom chats. You know, we, we've, as a church, done a bit of that in our time, especially around pandemic. But what I'm really talking about is that we gather together and we confer with one another to discover what it means to be disciples of Christ in our world today. And we come to a lot of decisions, you know, like if you've served in church leadership, you know what it is to go through things like committee meetings. We make decisions about how we're going to do church together, you know, what's going to make Epworth Epworth. How do we minister to our people? How do we minister to the people outside of our walls? And we kind of examine, what does our faith have to say about the complex issues of our time? What is our role in those issues? And of course, hey, how do we spend our money? We give collectively to the mission and ministry of the church. How are we going to use our money? And everybody, of course, is going to have their opinion about how to do that naturally. But we as Methodists try to do it in a way that reflects the intentions of God. And we do it very deliberately, very methodically. And holy conferencing really is what we're all about. You know, it's not just a simple matter of getting together to have conversations and worship and fellowship. No, 
there's a, a spirit and guiding principles that help us to talk to each other about things that we may not agree on, and it keeps us in line with what we believe God intends for our conduct. Because believe you me, God has certain expectations for us about our conduct that are meant to set us apart from other people, you know? Chief among those is the ability to remain connected with people who might have alternate perspectives to our own, to be able to do it in love. You know, we know that when we sin, we take a position that's different from what God may intend for us, but God loves us anyway. I mean, almost miraculously so, and continues to strive to help us to be our best selves and also offers us companionship along the way, you know? If you love someone, that's what you do when you love someone. You know, when you truly love someone, you love them in spite of the way that they're different from you, in spite of the things that may rankle you about them. But, and this is very commonplace in today's world, have you ever experienced the sense that Maybe a person with a different opinion from yours might not consider you to be what we would call a child of God. Have you ever felt dehumanized by someone else because they thought differently from you? I really want you to think on that for a second. You might not have to think too much. So when they did that to you, how did it make you feel? As I said before, you know, it's, it's kind of commonplace these days. But I can remember a time when it wasn't always so. Now, I remember in my college days, and that was before social media really took off as a concept. Before, you know, when Facebook and things of the like were really just relegated to college campuses. Um, not the daily thing that it is in our lives now. I was never really confronted by my peers, you know, with how differently they thought about what was right for them and how it was different from what I thought was right. If we had differences, most of the time, you know, we'd just kind of sue them over. You know, we'd move on because we didn't want to let our differences affect our relationship. You know, unless there was some kind of like real red flag, you know, like, something that would give you pause and make you think, oh my gosh, I did not know you thought that way. I remember the first time a person that I considered to be a friend took exception with my stances on immigration. So in the early 90s in Southern California, there were changes happening to immigration enforcement that, frankly, would make today's more conservatively leaning policies seem rather tame. There was a proposition called Proposition 187, and it was put on the ballot in 1994. Now, I was 14. And my mom was in seminary at the time. Um, you know, uh, she was uh, still trying to finish out uh, the classes that were necessary for ordination, and California at the time was gripped by a period of economic recession. So Mexican immigrants were being used at that time as scapegoats for almost any social ill you could imagine. Now, Governor Pete Wilson was the most visible champion of this referendum. Then it was known as, if you can believe it, the Save Our State referendum, I mean, of all possible titles. <laughs> and it would restrict undocumented immigrants from accessing public health services and education. And it was all done in the name of uh, enforcement. Now, it also directed teachers and healthcare professionals to report any individual suspected of being undocumented to INS or the California Attorney General. And the measure passed with 59% of the vote. It led to massive protests throughout the state. So it was a really turbulent time to be a Californian. Now, my whole family participated in the protest because, no duh, like we're Mexican, and because we understood that the issue at hand wasn't really about documentation. 
It wasn't really about the law. It was about racism. And just a few weeks later, a federal judge ruled an injunction against the measure. Three years later, it was deemed unconstitutional by a federal judge. And later, it was discovered that um, anti-immigrant organizations were almost entirely responsible for the measure reaching the voters to begin with. Uh, groups that used people's fears and unfamiliarity with rising Mexican immigration at the time to demonize and dehumanize what was a growing population within the state at the time. In today's world, it's just kind of become part of the mainstream culture. No one really talks about it much anymore, um, maybe a little bit more outside California, and it's certainly picked up during election season. Now, I will say that it wasn't so much that Proposition 187 wasn't a valid idea in concept, of course not. It is possible to argue that the United States should defend its border with Mexico, just as it should defend its sovereignty against any uh, foreign state. That's just good sense, you know? After all, we are well aware, we are well aware of the way that massive drug cartels use the border to smuggle people and product into our country. And of course, hostile foreign governments have been shown to partner with organized crime to carry out activities that threaten our security. But you see, human nature rarely lets us explore these complex issues in dispassionate ways. There's always emotion there. You know, the conversation about immigration can be very painful because people have strong opinions about it. And unfortunately, they are too often rooted in their prejudices. Now, holy conferencing. Holy conferencing keeps us humble. And it reminds us that our words have power, you know, the power to kill and the power to heal. Being passionate about an issue isn't a problem in holy conferencing. In fact, when we hear people, our siblings in Christ, discuss issues that they are very passionate about, it can be inspiring, it can motivate us to action. The real problem occurs when speech becomes inflammatory. You know, when we have clear, reasonable, hopefully careful dialogue about matters that are important to us, our passion reaches people, but inflammatory speech doesn't really reach anyone, except perhaps for the people who are having their biases confirmed. That kind of speech doesn't really care about the truth. It doesn't care about saving anyone or swaying anyone. Its intent is to harm, and we've all experienced it. That's why it hurts so much when we try to have a conversation with someone particularly online, about an issue that we care about, and then they put us down for having a different view. Because it's not a conversation then. It's kind of like bullying, almost. And when we're the ones doing it, because we've all been there, we know it. We know what we're doing, but in our anger, we may just not care. We may not care about the other person and what they think. Now, John Wesley wrote of this in his preface to sermons on several occasions. Uh, a little bit on the nose there with that title. See if his words resonate with you. Be not displeased if I entreat you not to beat me down in order to quicken my pace in coming to your persuasion not to give me hard names in order to bring me into the right way. Suppose I was ever so much in the wrong, I doubt this would not set me right. Rather, it would make me run so much farther from you and so get more and more out of the way. For God's sake, if it be possible to avoid it, let us not provoke one another to wrath. Let us not kindle in each other this fire of hell, much less blow it into flame. For if we die without love, what will knowledge avail? 
So here, I think Wesley is saying that provoking others to anger really doesn't work well in changing hearts and minds. It just pushes people away from us. Even so, we're still drawn to using anger as a tool to get our point across. Wesley is saying here that even if, in the end, we feel that we've won the argument, but we've lacked love, is there a victory there? And churches, you know, churches are they're hotbeds for this kind of speech, inflammatory speech, because you know, the Holy Spirit does attract many different kinds of people to coexist under the same roof. And yeah, we might carefully curate in our own ways the people we want to have in our churches. There are many systems, active and passive, that do precisely that. But I dare say that none of those systems are God-led. Because what a strange way we seem to work at cross purposes with God who keeps putting people into our lives and into our midst, sending us more and more people, and then we promptly send them on their way because, well, they're just not our people, you know? Occasions like the upcoming commemoration of 9-11 remind us of times of national unity. For those of you old enough to remember 9-11, you might recall how, despite all of our differences, a lot of us were on the same page. There was a, a national furor that gripped the US and its allies. It had positive and negative results, of course. Positive in that you know, we were at times able to set aside our differences for the good of the nation. You might recall a surge in enlistment in the armed services at the time. My brother was swept up in that. But there were also negative effects. There was the unfortunate rise of Islamophobia, the denigration of Muslims. And yet, our God can use both the negative and positive to muster some good out of troubling situations. In this sermon series on Methodism, you've had a chance to hear about Methodism's British roots, but not so much about American Methodism. And the reason I bring up 9-11 and its commemoration and these times of national unity is to help us to remember that unity is in fact possible despite great difference when we focus on what's important. Way back before the founding of this country, in our colonial history, Methodists made their way to the shores of Maryland to spread the gospel in their own way. And in fact, not all of them spoke English. There were a fair number of German folks, too. And not all of them were British. But the influence of Methodism was so strong in Europe as it caught hold that it drew all kinds of people into its fold. I want to share with you a brief story of two Irish Methodists, Robert and Elizabeth Strawbridge. And they came to what we now call Maryland to make a new life for themselves, but also to spread the gospel to the immigrants that would call this land their home at the time. Now, they brought with them out of their Irish tradition, knowledge of the Methodist class meetings. These were the old societies that British Methodists had formed in the early days of the Methodist movement, and they used them to create their own model of ministry. They did this without having been sent by anyone in authority. Recall that John and Charles Wesley were Anglican priests sent by the Church of England to the New World. Robert and Elizabeth Strawbridge weren't sent by anyone. They just came. And they had a solid understanding of the power of the model of the Methodist class meeting to bring people to the Savior. And they approached their evangelism in a couple of different ways. If you've ever been to what we call the Strawbridge Shrine, you'll see two commemorations, two statues, one of Robert and one of Elizabeth there, and it really speaks to the way that they each 
brought the gospel to that area. So Robert, being an Irish preacher, he bucked many of the traditions and constraints of British Methodists to be able to bring a full experience of Christianity to everyone that he met, all these settlers that were moving into an area that had plenty of land, but no church buildings or formal institutions. He worked to establish many Methodist classes in Delaware, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, Trenton, New Jersey, Georgetown in DC, and Leesburg, Virginia. Elizabeth Strawbridge tended to the family farm as Robert was away. But she also offered class meetings, sometimes in her very kitchen, offering the gospel to all of her neighbors. One neighbor in particular, a Quaker man named John Evans, who had heard Elizabeth preach, you know, he'd come and he'd help Elizabeth with the farm work. And one day when Elizabeth was offering the gospel in her kitchen, they say that she was stirring a, a pot of soup, an enormous pot of soup. Evans experienced a conversion experience. Recall, he was a Quaker. And he became what we know as the first Methodist convert in America. And from there, Methodism began to depart from its Anglican roots, right? It was not meant to be a denomination. It was Anglican. But it began to depart from that to become a denomination in its own right. And what were these class meetings? Well, think of a group, usually a smaller group, no more than 12 individuals or so. If the group grew larger than that, they'd create a new meeting. And they would meet regularly outside of church to have prayer. They would also do Bible study, but the most important element was mutual encouragement in their faith. They would discuss matters of faith openly as they pertain to their lives and their struggles. They would share in brave vulnerability the issues that they were dealing with, some very personal things, in a safe space. And they would gently admonish each other while also helping to find solutions to problems before they became greater sins. They confronted a lot of things that we in our time would call social ills before they ever became worse. Now in the modern United Methodist Church, we've kind of lost that tradition, this idea of the class meeting. We do have small groups, but not every church has them. And yet the spirit remains. We conference in different levels for different reasons. All have the same intent, to have holy conversations where the truth is shared, and where love abounds. And I do believe that this is God's hope for the church. Not just the church, but this church, our church, Epworth Church. Jesus prays for it in John chapter 17, verse 21. I pray they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. So that the world would believe that you sent me. Imagine that. When you roll out of worship here today, and you go out into the world, can you believe that the world that you touch can come to believe in Christ when they see the way that we make our speech and our actions holy. That is what it means to be set apart. The world, you know, has plenty of examples of how things look when people don't agree. And I would say that it has formed expectations about those moments. But we, who are called to be holy, have been asked to show the world something different, something hopeful. When we keep first things first, when we focus on what's important, the gospel of Christ, when we offer it in unity, not uniformity, unity, well, we show the world that a savior reigns. May the Lord of hosts bless us 
and keep us on this path of holiness. May God make us fit for service to each other and indeed to the world. And may God's name be praised. <laughs>